Welcome to the gamified life, relationship insecurities. But before we get to that, a quick recap of part one. The insecurity game within our mind uses a bucket that represents your current security using inputs, thresholds, and triggers. Security drains when triggers encountered, and breach thresholds initiate coping actions, both emotional and problem-focused coping, which fall within avoidant, secure, and anxious categories. The way to improve solo security? Leveling up confidence through improving skills, knowledge, and resources. And with that, let's talk about relationship, aka player 2 insecurity. In terms of a relationship, it becomes a little more complicated. Once in a relationship, all the different securities from our solo player buckets work together with our partner's security buckets. The weight in our lives shift to include the importance of our player too. On top of our own inputs, all of a sudden what our partners say will have a lot more weight behind it, which also means what we thought was secure can suddenly be no longer secure. Because of a simple, you got fat, eh? Anything they say can drastically change how we feel about ourselves, leading to reforming triggers and boosting past triggers. So on top of how relationships impact personal buckets, we also need to deal with relationship insecurity itself. Because relationships are so complicated, let's break it down into three steps as well. First, understanding the relationship security bucket. The relationship bucket is unique to other buckets because its underlying attribute is trust, instead of confidence as you see in the previous buckets. Why? When we work on ourselves, we know ourselves best. Well, most of the time. We know where we stand, how we feel on things, and where our current state lies. Meanwhile, in relationships, there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding our player too. We don't fully understand each other, which can lead us to the enemy of trust, the cause of relationship insecurity triggers, doubt. And once the threshold is breached, we develop these fears and doubts against each other, lacking the ability to trust, leading to fear of losing one another. Breaching relationship security bucket thresholds can create many different forms of irrational coping behavior that can be toxic towards a healthy relationship environment, such as feelings of possessiveness and control, where everything is mine, 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 mine. That means you are mine too, not allowed to do as you please. Feelings of neglect and abandonment, where you crave attention to feel validated. Feelings of being misunderstood, where things are not properly communicated. I didn't say I wanted to date a nun, I said I wanted to go for a run. Feelings of incompetence, why can't you get it already? And many more. These feelings that are invoked from our past traumas get a lot more complicated when mixed with attachment styles. Each style comes with its pros and cons, complications and strategies. When confronted with a more avoidant style in a relationship, you will likely face someone who avoids talking about the issues and hides the negative emotions, tucking them away and avoiding confrontation. It's not because they do not want to solve the issue, but more so it's difficult to bring up hurtful and negative topics within the relationship, and thus downplaying issues. When confronted with a more anxious style, you will likely face someone who is constantly nervous or stressed about the relationship and needs constant reassurance and affection from their partners. For them, it's not that there is anything wrong with the relationship, but more so find it difficult to settle down their uncertainties. When confronted with a secure style, you will likely face someone who is more direct and insensitive. They have a head start with being above the threshold, but in return, may lack empathy thus doing more harm than good. These styles are simply a part of our attachment style, and they flow from one to the other over time based on our experiences. So it becomes very important to understand the different points of view, where everyone is coming from, and the different dynamic between the different styles, bringing us to step two, environment building. The way our relationship security buckets level up mainly revolve around two points, raising trust and eliminating doubt. Trust is built through understanding each other and knowing that you're safe around each other. It takes time to nurture and grow. And to do this, we need to create the correct environment for the bucket to prosper. Using different class buckets to demonstrate different environments, the C class bucket represents a low level environment. It is very explosive with lots of arguments, taboo topics, and triggers to navigate around, making it very difficult to communicate with an overall low trust level. Meanwhile on the top, the ultimate S-class bucket represents a high-level environment with an open, safe space where anything and everything can be talked about and no feelings of being threatened. These environments level alongside skills, knowledge, and resources. With skills and abilities such as honesty, transparency, patience, communication, listening, respect, bravery, resilience to criticism, and open-mindedness to name a few. 
Knowledge includes understanding one another's thought patterns, their attachment styles and how to work around them, and knowledge of where to get relationship answers. As for resources, the many items that you use to enhance the relationship environment and diffuse conflicts, such as phones to keep you connected and increase conversations, desserts to help ease triggers and lower the impact of bad actions, presents to improve likability and demonstrate awareness, and handwritten letters to really express your love and deepen the relationship. And with the right skills, resources, and knowledge, we can now arm ourselves to create the perfect environment to tackle step three, removing the trigger. I like to separate relationship triggers into two main categories. One, the root of the trigger, and two, the trigger amplifier with the root of the trigger being those that are deeply embedded within ourselves. Things like high expectations, clashing priorities and values, jealousy, or fear of loss. And with trigger amplifiers being reactions that make the trigger worse, lowering the environment. Today, we'll only be looking closer at the trigger amplifiers because each root trigger can be a huge game in itself to be covered at a later time. Trigger amplifiers are different for each player as we all respond to triggers differently, according to our attachment style. And when dealt with incorrectly, our responses can be perceived as toxic, which may lead to devastating repercussions. So let's revisit attachment theory and unlock some knowledge. To start, people who are avoidant usually, well, keep the situation to themselves, leading to a lack of communication and understanding. If they are able to overcome the situation from within, through internalization, then they could resolve the situation peacefully and overcome. However, if it's never resolved, the problem lingers behind as resentment, which will grow bigger and bigger over time for as long as the situation is unresolved, placing a burden on the relationship. Some avoidant trigger amplifiers include distancing the other person, being passive aggressive, or in extreme cases, imploding mentally. On the other hand, people who are anxious tend to express their worries over the situation, leading to a higher maintenance relationship. If the anxious player manages to regulate their emotions and express things objectively, then the situation can be overcome peacefully. However, if the situation remains unregulated, the problem will turn exaggerated and resentment accumulates. Some anxious trigger amplifiers include outbursts of emotions, needy and clingy behaviors, and desperation. Unfortunately, these amplifiers usually lead to an explosive, toxic relationship environment that can't get things solved. And furthermore, there are no simple battle plans that fits all the situations. There are, however, many strategies that everyone can use. Strategy 1. Signaling One of these strategies which I enjoy using is what I call signaling. But that is because I find myself to be more avoidant, especially when it comes to confrontations. Signaling works as a joint effort agreement reminder. This means that after a conflict has been properly discussed and resolved, both sides agree to tackle the problem together using a signal. Why is a signal necessary? Well, resolutions don't come easy. The root of the conflict could be big and overbearing, stemming from current core levels and traits, which makes agreements that are made not that easy to fulfill, requiring a lot of joint effort, using lots of patience and encouragement, allowing time to nourish. So next time, when you encounter the problem again, you simply just need to use the agreed signal to allow your partner the space to take ownership, and with some encouragement, bring them one step closer to the agreement standards. Using signals also prevents guessing games where you indirectly hurt each other with toxic actions. Let's use an example. Perhaps there is an unwanted habit that both you and your partner agree would be better off without, like spending or drinking habits. So in order to remind one another, a signal or keyword can be used instead of confronting the problem again, like using a keychain. Because you both agree to work on it together, when the situation arises again, bam, signal unleash, problem addressed. Signals could also be small gestures or sending an icon through a messaging app, anything that can serve as a safe, subtle reminder. Something I'd like to note about this is, three times you're out does not apply. More often than not, when we first encounter a problem, we think that it's settled right after it's discussed. The second time the same topic resurfaces, triggers are more heavily impacted because we thought it was solved prior, and by the third time, we're done with the problem. This is a very bad approach, which usually leads to an environment with nothing getting solved and the problem escalating. Remember, everything is a slow change. It's not an easy process to change our ingrained principles and values. 
and through revisiting signals time and time again with the right methods, triggers will level down and environment improves in the process. Another strategy I use is what I call internalize and meditate, especially when I find myself to be anxious, restless over certain things that are outside my control. Whenever we encounter a situation, it's very easy to get trapped in our mind's activated thinking, automatically assuming the worst case scenario along with the anger, sadness, and suffering that comes with it. This is especially apparent in relationships where as soon as something happens, our minds go on a journey of its own. And we end up thinking that we're being cheated on. So when we're stuck in our mind's negative space, our capacity to solve problems and see things for what they are become limited. We become more irritable and easily sad, our thoughts uncontrollable. This is why whenever we encounter a problem that follows the wiring in our heads, it's very advantageous to switch the tracks using the strategy internalize and meditate. Internalize requires you to take notice when your emotions get riled up and reset them to a calmer state of mind. One way of doing this is by using the 4x4 or box breathing technique, where you focus on your breathing. Breathe in for 4 seconds, hold for 4 seconds, breathe out for 4 seconds, and up to 4 times. This is a great way to reset our minds, step away from our emotional thoughts, and enter meditation. There are many types of meditation, but for this particular case, let's focus on being aware, breaking down the feelings and thought patterns, and understanding them, commonly known as mindfulness meditation or Zen meditation. During this meditation session, it's important to be intentional in the breakdown of our current mental state, where we observe the situation without judgment, perhaps from another's perspective. Understanding questions like, why do I feel this way? Do I want to feel this way? Is this the me I want to be? What is holding me back? And how can I change myself? This topic is extremely broad and more in depth, deserving of a complete set of videos for itself. But for now, through enough intentional meditation, understanding of who we are and what we want to be, we can slowly take control of our emotions and stop allowing them to dictate our lives, removing the triggers and improving the relationship environment in the process. Keep in mind, things are simply just the way they are, and it's not anyone's fault. These strategies are just the tip of the iceberg, but nonetheless, great skills to practice in order to level up the environment required for a high-level intimate relationship. So if you're in a relationship that is struggling with insecurities, where would be a good place to start? I like to start with a discussion over boundaries what you and your partner consider as cheating or stepping over the line. Using what I call a boundary spectrum, we can distribute everything from the maximum restrictions to no restrictions based on what people think they can and can't do, such as talking to someone of the opposite gender, to things like group hangouts, one-on-ones, along with the frequency of these events. Any physical behavior can be placed on the spectrum. On the far ends, we have the extremes, with infidelity, adultery on one side, and complete isolation on the other. Though to some, these are completely acceptable. As for emotional behaviors, this gets very complicated, regarding things like self-control and satisfaction, and so much more. So I'll leave it for another time. For now, let's stick to the more obvious physical behaviors. Every boundary starts somewhere. Let's call it the baseline, an area that represents what we are not comfortable with the other person doing. And as soon as someone crosses into my baseline, I'll get triggered and view it as cheating, even if the behavior did no harm to the relationship. We create our baselines as a way to protect ourselves from getting hurt. So how can we improve the relationship? I believe couples should work together on shifting the baseline towards a place I call the golden zone. This lies somewhere right before the extreme ends of having zero restrictions. And it's a very difficult thing to accomplish because we have a natural inclination to shift boundaries the other way and become more restricting. After all, we want to guard and protect what's ours, and putting restrictions and boundaries give us comfort. However, its trade-off is actually very toxic to the relationship and prevents it from moving forward. Oftentimes, relationships go down a vicious cycle of guilt, fear, and obligation, leading to its inevitable downfall, especially when harmless actions are perceived as great threats. Restrictions will end up gathering resentment and poison the environment. I won't get into it fully this video, but in short, every restriction you place on a relationship, whether consciously or subconsciously, when dealt with incorrectly, 
will put a strain on the relationship to some degree. And so, by moving towards the golden zone intentionally, you learn to lower your guard and be vulnerable to one another, not allowing harmless actions to weigh down on the relationship. Once the relationship can maintain its baseline in the golden zone, you are able to maximize the benefits that come with it. Character benefits like loyalty and self-respect from being in a monogamous relationship. Where there is no sleeping around, it reflects in your character showing dedication and commitment. There are also benefits like freedom and independence, where you are free yet feel safe and secure in the relationship without the downsides of restrictions. Instead of saying, I am only secure if you follow these rules, and thus withholding the relationship back, we should aim to be brave, be vulnerable, earn the trust and give the trust that everything will be okay. As the relationship security bucket levels up, the environment also opens up. The boundaries slowly move and achieve a trust-based relationship. Sometimes, if the couple is happy where they are and do not wish to progress their level and potential, then that is perfectly fine. Every relationship has its own dynamic of how things are done, and if certain boundaries are meant to stay, then they can stay. Some people in relationships choose to keep these boundaries simply because they want to protect themselves. Perhaps they can't trust themselves or each other. Perhaps they know that their urges get the better of them. Perhaps they're afraid of being vulnerable. But ultimately, I personally believe that if you love someone, you should set them free and those who stay will always be yours. This may be an unthinkable thing to do, but if your actions are powered by love, not fear, you can grant each other happiness, which includes unrestricted freedom. Don't worry, we know our limits. Only by removing our boundaries and fully embracing the vulnerabilities that come with it will a beautiful relationship bloom, completely based on trust and love. It's time to stop using toxic behaviors to claim and protect what's yours, and time to attract what's yours to stay. In conclusion, we are all just a mixture of different coping mechanisms based on our attachment styles, but in the end, everyone just wants to feel okay. Know that coping styles will not necessarily get rid of the seeds of doubt as it's not very effective, but through understanding and acceptance will doubt slowly be let go. Take a step back and realize how we let ourselves be controlled by our automatic responses, even though they're just trying to help us through tough times. It could be damaging to yourself and your relationships. When working with the help of player 2, slowly understand that everything is okay. Things aren't quite as serious as our minds make them up to be. Use strategies that can remove the seeds of doubt through a foundation of understanding, and slowly put down irrational triggers and thought processes. The controller is in your hands. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also, you can support me on Patreon. It's super appreciated. This video has been extremely hard to put together, and the scripts went through many, many iterations. Almost quit altogether to go make a different video on an easier topic. So a huge thank you all for being so patient. I'm also planning on being more active on social media. So consider following me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. All the links will be down below. Till next time, the controller is in your hands.